Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode six of The Anonymous Hedgehog. Um, I'm Rich. And I'm Maya. And today we're going to be talking about STEM superiority. So for those of you who don't know, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And those fields tend to generally be more objective than the discussion-based fields of, you know, political science and law. Um, And because of that objectivity and oftentimes just the higher salaries that come from going into a STEM field um, over sort of a liberal arts major, there seems to be a sort of superiority complex around STEM majors. Have you seen this exist? Yeah, I've definitely seen this exist, and I'm, like, definitely guilty of it, too. Uh Like, I know, like, we're, I guess we're biased because we're both STEM majors. Yeah. But I feel like it's pretty justified. Mm -hmm. Um, And the reason is because, uh, like, the reason I feel that STEM majors have, like, they have a right to feel superior is just that, um, like, almost every other, like, science, social science, or kind of, like, area of study is Mm -hmm. built off of STEM. So, like, -hmm. you think of, like, math is basically, like, the most, like, basic, and then physics is built off of math, and, like, engineering is based off of physics and, like, computer Mm -hmm. science, too. And I just feel like they only exist because of the existence of math and, like, data science and things like that. And, like, all their studies and all their research that they can do only exists because of STEM majors. Oh, so you're, that's interesting. I never thought about like STEM as a hierarchy all built on like other principles of STEM. Mm -hmm. But do you think like the humanities is also built on STEM? Like how could law be related to like mathematics and computer science? Well, because I think like law, well, because like the basic of law is that like you need evidence to like sue someone, right? Mm -hmm. And so like that forensic evidence and like DNA evidence that's basically built on bio and then mm. um, they use statistics and things like that that's built on, um, like, math and kind of, like, data science. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess, like, philosophy is would be the, I guess, the only foundation, I would say, that's not directly connected to some kind of STEM major. Ah, uh, I see. That's interesting, though, because, like, given that, like, law is just a more complex version of math, that like derives itself from STEM, if it's more complex, then shouldn't the people in the field of law feel more superior? Because not only are they using STEM, but they're also adding additional information of things like um, textbook knowledge and like discussion and debates. Mm, yeah, I see, I see that a lot. It's just like, um, yeah. I mean, I guess that's sort of true, but at the same time, like lawyers don't understand the fundamentals behind Mm, math and stuff a lot of the times they just use it they use like the data derived by other people but they don't actually fully understand like the methods of deriving the data and the calculation Mm -hmm. they just use it and they just like they read the study and they see like oh 50 percent of whatever and they just use the stats yeah yeah that's true so like i guess the people that like are in stem are in possession of like the secrets of stem and then, like, mm-hmm. they just hand those secrets over to people in the humanities, and the, the people in the humanities just use them. Mm-hmm. And I also feel like um, I see this correlation a lot, which is like people that are good at STEM are like likely to be good at humanities fields too. Like, mm. um, the, there's you see this thing with the LSAT. Like, I've done a lot of research into this, which uh-huh. is basically like pretty much like math majors, engineering majors, and Mm -hmm. like hard STEM majors usually perform the traditionally like lawyer majors on the LSAT. Even Mm. though like, even though like people say the ideal major for to be a lawyer is probably like poli sci, sociology, whatever. People who major in STEM oftentimes score higher than those ideal law majors. I see. You know, that's interesting. I've always thought about like, like how standardized tests evaluate your reading skills. Uh And like, for example, like with the SAT, I don't know about the LSAT, but with like the SAT, it's like four or five multiple choice um, answers. And you just select the best one. um, Mm -hmm. And the questions will be something along the lines of like, oh, like best summarize the passage or like, what is the author trying to say? And to me, that's the opposite of the fundamentals of reading. Like, like that's taking something that is so subjective. Like, what is the author trying to say? Because you could metaphorically analyze an author's mm. argument in so many ways. Mm-hmm. And that's turning it into an objective 
answer choice where there's only one answer. And so honestly, I feel like that testing strategy is biased towards a STEM major's mind because a STEM major is already fine tuned to believe that there's only one thing the author's saying, whereas like a law major might Mm. try to interpret the different arguments and the different complexities within that. Mm, Yeah, that's true. I think a lot of the superiority does come from like the belief that science in general is just more subjective. Like there is like, or uh, objective, sorry, like there's an Mm -hmm. objective truth. Like there's an objective correct answer to this math question. Like you can solve it in different ways, but you know, you're not going to get a different right answer. But in like things like English, they're kind of trained, like almost like if you see like there isn't one way to interpret a book, like there isn't Mm -hmm. one message to derive from that. And they're kind of trained to this, like almost like everyone can have their own take. And I I do Mm -hmm. agree. I think that can be like in a way detrimental to like those standardized tests where they're supposed to test you on like essentially like an objective truth. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so true. And like, like besides just the objectivity, I think a lot of it also stems from like, (laughs) stems from, also (laughs) stems from like people being, you know, the phrase all talk, no action. Like I know with a lot of humanities fields, they're so focused on discussion Mm. and gaining insight from talking, reading, debating, agreeing, disagreeing that to STEM majors, it feels almost as if you're going in a circle without actually creating any concrete change. Whereas with a STEM, with the STEM field, it's like, oh, like, here's a problem. Let me solve it by creating this app. Here's a problem. Mm. Let me solve it by using this equation. And it's like a clear cut solution that you work on. Mm. Yeah, I think that there's like a misconception that like STEM majors are like not creative because I think they're Mm -hmm. some of the most creative people um, Mm -hmm. and because they have to they have to link those real world scenarios to their STEM. And I think that I think that that's one of the things that like one of the bases like base like yeah, like one of the foundations of like STEM Mm -hmm. superiority is just that I think STEM majors are forced to understand humanities because that's the application of their STEM. But like, ap- like humanities majors are not really forced to understand STEM at the same level because yeah. like the only reason STEM exists is to serve society. So we have to understand how we can use, let's say, computer science, engineering to serve society. Mm-hmm. But like, like those humanities majors, they, it doesn't work the other way around like that. Mm-hmm. That's very true. That's very true. Have you have you ever noticed like like the superiority complex reversed? Like have you ever felt that like a humanities major is looking down on you because you're a STEM major? I have yeah, I definitely have felt that, but I don't know. I guess I feel like in my mind, I know they're wrong, so I don't really <laughs> care. <laughs> but no, I do think that st- like <laughs> I think that I do think that there are a lot of humanities majors who I feel like it's more of just like like they're just like, oh, I'm making like a real difference in the world and kind of that mentality Mm. versus like they think that they are like necessarily like more intelligent than you or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've what I've noticed is like I feel like the same way. But what I've noticed is that with humanities majors, sometimes it's like like we're actually having the real legitimate conversations and all you're doing is just like making an app. Like you're, you're replaceable. Like you, you can just Mm. be replaced by a machine. You can just like a machine can make an app, but like these real human conversations are like innately human and we need like a real person to be doing these tasks. And so that's where like the reverse superiority comes from. Mm. The thing is, I also feel that I don't know if this is like necessarily 100% true, but mm-hmm. I feel like this things like humanities majors, they've been like discussing or like basically the only, like like you said in a previous episode, like there are only so many sides to a discussion, if that makes mm. sense. Like you can like you can only discuss so much before you end up going in circles and circles. Uh-huh. But technology is constantly developing. And so yeah. we're constantly introducing new things. But like for for example in politics, like we've been having the same conversations for years, like literally yeah. like centuries. You know, like yeah. people still cite like like Aristotle, like and like <laughs> like to like back up their argument. And they still cite mm-hmm. like like Marx and like all these people that like if you like the saying like history repeats itself it's like Mm. our discussions are constantly repeating themselves and we I think the idea is just like 
there is no answer is the fundamental truth to like humanities and like um but I guess that's not necessarily true of STEM. We're just like constantly finding new answers or constantly developing new technology. That's so, that's so well said. That's so true too. That's yeah. Like technology doesn't repeat itself. Mm -hmm. Technology has just been exponentiating since the start of history. Mm -hmm. But these discussions like, yeah, people are always, in fact, I think texts from like a hundred years ago are often cited more than just like mm -hmm. recent texts because it's the same discussion and it was said better a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So you just keep citing the same thing. That's an interesting point. <laughs> Honestly, I feel like I've been playing like devil's advocate for up until now uh -huh. <laughs> um, because I also like, I also am guilty of falling into that like trap of like, Oh, like I'm a STEM major. Like, you wouldn't understand. Like, you, you don't know how to code. Like, you wouldn't understand. Yeah. Do you think that one of them is objectively harder? No, definitely not. In fact, I think that the humanities are harder. Really? It, it really depends. Well, because I know a law student personally. And, like, just because, just because like, STEM is objective, I think that makes it easier. Because there's only only so many solutions you have to learn to a given problem set with something mm -hmm. like law like gosh if you look at the sizes of those law textbooks mm -hmm. that they give out to students these days they're huge and mm -hmm. it's like you have to review every single like supreme court case the mm -hmm. u.s has ever had and like look at all the like multifaceted sides of the argument mm -hmm. and understand each part of it. And like, yeah, it's the same arguments at the end of the day when you look at it from like a really broad scope. Mm -hmm. But these lawyers are like supposed to be like perfect in their craft. Like they need to know mm -hmm. every argument at its peak. And so when you go that deep into it, the arguments aren't repeating themselves because there's just so many different tiny discrepancies. Mm -hmm. You bring up, like, the thing about law textbooks. I think it's kind of interesting. Like, another reason um, that STEM superiority probably exists is because, like, all those law books and all these, like, legislation, all these things are written by humans. But the mm. thing about science is that, like, at least the foundation of it is not, like, it's a universal, like, it's a universal law. Like, for, like, F equals MA, we didn't, like, make it up. Like, it mm -hmm. exists, like objectively but mm. like these ideas of philosophy are just like the truth is we just made them up and like you know we can debate like whether or not like they're moral or they're true but like they didn't they don't exist as just like the universe existing like it's not like an objective like fact like you know they don't exist just because the universe existed we like as humans we just created them and like we're mm -hmm. analyzing our own creations you have to give me a minute to just think about that. <laughs> <laughs> but also, like, going back to, like, um, I don't know. I personally, I've done, like, a lot of, I guess, different, taking a lot of different classes and things in both fields. And mm. I personally have always found, I've always found STEM feels harder. But mm. not because, I think that, like, STEM fields, it's, like, this the concept is... Or I guess, like, the truth is that you just can't bullshit it. I feel like sometimes mm -hmm. in, like, liberal arts majors and liberal arts curriculum, if you don't know, you mm -hmm. can kind of just, like, make something up. Or you can, like, you can come up with something, you know? But if you're solving, like, a calculus equation, like, you, like, yeah. if you don't know how to do it, then you don't know how to do it. Like, yeah. that's that's just it. That's, There's like, only one answer. I've always yeah. felt like, yeah, about yeah. STEM. Yeah, up until now, I agree with you. I've felt the same way. Like, all my STEM classes have been significantly harder. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's just the way the public education system is right now. But if you if you look at, like, like getting a law degree, because that's different from, mm. like, taking, you know, an English class at a public school. That's true. Um, in that case, I feel like things can be harder. But l let's go back to the second thing you said, which was mm -hmm. really interesting and threw me into, like, <laughs> a mind warp of like stem stem being derived from objective rules that inherently exist in the universe mm -hmm. it, it's interesting to think about because like with the liberal arts and humanities like the humanities is the study of like how humans operate and like the the nature of like a population and i i feel like human nature to some extent is also objectively inherited from nature does that make sense 
Um, so, like, what do you mean? Like, for example, like, our morals. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter where you're born or who raises you. Like, yeah. you could be... It could be, a like, let's propose a scientific experiment where a child is um, raised in, like, an island where, like, the parents don't actually, like, teach it any values. Um, they only give it the bare resources. And obviously that'd be an unethical experiment, but, like, just for, for the <laughs> yeah, sake yeah. of thinking, um, <laughs> if you brought the child to a society and you told it to kill someone, like inherently it would still know that hurting another human is morally wrong because these feelings of sympathy and empathy reside in us from the from the moment we're born like they're inherent and so i think i think that is very similar to just how you know force equals mass times acceleration that's just a rule of the universe some of our morals are just rules of our human nature so i think i agree with that but i feel like just because I think that this is, it's kind of amplified by the fact that there's like so much disagreement about morality. I think that not necessarily everyone agrees with that, like those moral truths exist because, or those moral truths like exist outside of like, just like within the universe. Because I think that like there might be like, just because humans necessarily like feel bad, like obviously I'm not saying that killing people is moral, but I'm just like, like, the um just because we feel like bad about killing someone else doesn't necessarily like indicate its morality like morality itself exists only because of the existence of humans in the way we think like okay let's i feel like the example is just like if humans didn't exist all Mm -hmm. these physical laws would still be true but those moral laws would just like vanish because we made them up i see what you're saying yeah I guess it's a different sphere Mm. of physical laws because these physical laws exist within ourselves. Mm -hmm. I I guess they're kind of intuitive and, and you're kind of making me question like, are our morals even objectively true? Like there's a reason why there's so many different religions Mm. because people had to, like there was a need to legitimately write down the moral code on a piece of paper and say, Mm -hmm. this is the moral code. Mm-hmm. So, so I guess it isn't as objective as I like thought it was because the fact that you have to write down on a piece of paper, like, mm-hmm. no, don't kill other people because God says it's bad, shows that like within us as humans, we don't have the inherent sense to know that it's bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there's just so much debate about this. Like, like most religions, they believe that morals are inherent, even if they disagree what they are. But like mm-hmm. a lot of atheists and maybe even agnostics will say that like, there is no objective morality. Morality is only like relative to other things. So then what if we interpreted morality wrong? Like, what do you mean? Like we interpreted it wrong. Like, like, let's say, obviously this is a stretch and I know it's not true, but like, Mm -hmm. what if we were intended to kill each other? Like that was our purpose. Like our purpose was to murder, Mm. but but now, like, society has told us that it's wrong to murder. And because there's no objective sense of morality, we all believe it. And we believe it so, so vehemently that we can't even dream of having to kill each other. But in reality, that's what God intended. I feel like this is actually kind of true. I'm not saying, obviously, that killing each other is good. Like, that's uh-huh. so I, that's disclaimer. I'm not saying that. Yeah. But, like, okay, if you think of, like, I was actually... Um, like I was actually thinking of this in regards to natural selection Mm -hmm. because like, obviously like natural, like social natural selection is bad, but like Mm -hmm. natural selection, like what Darwin's principles were, were that like we, as they essentially like kill off like the weaker members of the population. Um, and this allows for like evolution over time, right? Mm -hmm. Because, um, the the stronger or the more fit members of the population are able to survive and reproduce. But Mm -hmm. what we humans have done is essentially like stopped, like stalled that because we believe that every life is valuable. Even those that are like disabled, those that have genetic abnormalities, those that are considered less fit, we still seek to preserve those lives. And obviously I think that's a good thing, but objectively that is not what the universe intended. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 
yeah, there's a lot of things that we do that go against nature. Like it's like even like if someone has a heart attack uh-huh. and you save their life, like what if that's wrong? Like what if them having a heart attack was nature's mm-hmm. like goal and then saving yeah. them goes again? Like what if saving them is the ultimate sin? And mm-hmm. we just don't know because we've interpreted our morals wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really like... <laughs> It's, like, really weird and, like, scary to think about. Yeah, and, I mean, I hope no one gets the wrong idea when yeah, we say like these things. Yeah, we're not things. saying that, like, obviously. We're not, yeah, it's all a thought experiment, but, <laughs> uh-huh. you know, it's it's similar to, like, when you think, think back, like, a couple hundred years and with slavery and everything, like, that was morally right. Like, it's more, people were in the mindset of, like, it's morally right to own a slave because it contributes to societal growth and slaves will help build this infrastructure that creates cities and creates jobs. And so that was, like, the accepted moral code. And then the moral code evolved and changed. Mm -hmm. And also, I feel like the whole concept of society, too. Like, society is human-created. Like, just because something is good for society doesn't necessarily mean that it was, like, what the universe intended and that Mm -hmm. it's, like, good. Because what if, like, society, like, people, like, let's just say, like, climate change or whatever. What if society itself is just bad? Like, like, you know, like, like, like humans are not, like, I mean, like, maybe, like, it would be better for, like, the planet if, like, literally all humans just killed themselves, like... (laughs) <laughs> like oh and not. in that in that case in that case murder would be morally correct because mm-hmm. you're reducing a human population that just hurts animals and mm-hmm. hurts plants and hurts yeah. the earth that's so interesting because it's and i mean like i can see i can see why someone would say that because technically we're an invasive species mm-hmm. like the the way we treat um i don't know like cockroaches in our house like for us, like, it's, it just makes sense to just kill all of them if they infest our house because they're invading our area. Mm-hmm. So, like, yeah. from the perspective of someone that's not a human, like, either, like, a higher being or, like, mm-hmm. another animal or something like that, it would just make sense to just get rid of all humans. But then from our perspective, that's morally wrong. Mm-hmm. I think you were talking about earlier with, like, the island example. Like, someone, like, humans will naturally, I guess, have, like an instinct that killing someone is bad. Do you think that only exists with, like, humans? Like, do you feel like animals or, like, I guess, yeah, like, animals with not as developed, like, prefrontal cortexes, do you think Mm -hmm. that they would have that instinct in them? Well, that's interesting, because, like, what... Well, what morals are you talking about that exist in animals? Well, I guess it's not morals anymore. It's just, like, do you have, like, a gut feeling that, like, killing one of your own is bad? Hmm. I mean, I can't say because, like, most most animals do kill their own, right? Do they? I feel like most animals. I don't know what animals would kill their own. I feel like okay, going back to the natural selection thing. Actually, I feel like they wouldn't. I mean, not that I would ever know, obviously, but I feel like they wouldn't because, like, they wouldn't kill their own. Or, yeah, because, or, like, at least most, like, organisms wouldn't. Because, like, the whole point of, like, natural selection is to further, like, the evolution of your own species, right? Like, survival and reproduction. And so, like, I guess the idea would be, like, that animals themselves wouldn't have to kill their own because, like, the environment would already, like, eliminate, like, the less fit ones. And so, like, it would be counterproductive to... I, I think that's that's missing a big part of like a an animal's mentality though because that's taking an individual's mentality and applying it to the entire population because like w- with an individual animal its goal is not to preserve its species its goal is to, oh, preserve, it's to preserve the itself. genes yeah that's and true and oftentimes in order to preserve its own genes and pass them on it has to kill other members of its own species Mm. So it it can contribute to its individual goal by hurting the aggregate goal. And that happens all the time with like Mm. males fighting other males and killing them in order to mate with the female. That's true. So like, yeah, I guess why is it that like humans have this moral system and like other species don't? Yeah, because, I mean, I guess we just talked about how animals don't have a moral system, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess, like, 
the majority of animals, not all, because I know like fish eat their own eggs and things like that, but the majority of animals, yeah, <laughs> what yeah fish the? are crazy, dude. They like change gender and things like that too. They're insane. I mean, I guess humans do that too now, but fish like fully like biologically change genders and then mate with the opposite gender if there's like less of one gender. They're crazy, Jeez. but that's another topic. But, <laughs> <laughs> but like besides for fish, like I feel like the average mammal would never kill its own like young, right? Mm-hmm. So I guess how could you make an animal kill its own like child and make it feel like that's the right thing to do? Is that possible? Like, is it possible to twist an animal's moral code? I th- I don't think it's like like twisting animals just like do they even have that like instinct in the first place that killing it that killing their own is bad i mean yeah because like they're not they're not right like if if they didn't have something that prevented them from doing it they would just do it so clearly there has to be something that exists that tells them Mm. no i need to be putting my effort into making sure that my young is raised and protecting my young instead of killing it yeah, that that's true, but that's like that's like taking like members of their own like family, but like unrelated members of their same species. I think that they wouldn't necessarily feel the same like gut reaction to not killing them because like a mother protecting her child is different from like a mother just like I don't know would they ever kill like just another animal of the same? Oh species? yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are totally different concepts. Oh. Yeah, but, like, the mother protecting her child, like, she's only doing that because she has some morals within her oh, that tell she's her like, to protect her child. So I'm saying, like, where are oh, those morals true, and can we true. change them? Because otherwise, it's a, it's a lot easier to just abandon the child. And that way you don't have to feed it. You don't have to find it resources. But, like, there's clearly animals have some moral sense, whether it's instinctual or not, to protect their child. I think that just goes back to the, like, the whole argument of they want to further their genetic material. Mm -hmm. It's just, like, that's the only, like, I think that that is probably, like, from an evolutionary perspective, the only reason that they would protect their child. Not necessarily because, like, they feel it morally, but it's, like, that's what animals are programmed to do. Hmm. So that's not a moral issue. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess the idea is just that humans, yeah, it's just, like, like, the humanity subjects, they, like, we, they rest on this morality that we humans kind of created. Mm-hmm. And that's why yeah. it just feels so subjective. And that's why it feels so, like, it's just hard to, like, grasp. And I feel like, I feel like a lot of it is just, like, we have these kind of, like, loopholes. Obviously, they exist in science, too. But we have these, like, constant paradoxes. And I feel like that's everywhere in humanities, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Like, I feel like science has, like, paradoxes, whatever. But, like, I think that, like, these paradoxes exist in, like, almost, like, every subject in humanities. Mm, That's true. And the only paradoxes that exist in science are, like, they're just because of a lack of understanding. Like, at the end of the day, almost Mm, everything is objective because you're just, like, you're, you're not making anything. You're just recording what already exists. So there's no reason for there to be a paradox in science. Because it's just recording things. But with with humanities, it's like two people record anything that's slightly different and boom, that's a paradox. But I I think that what people have... I think that was also something interesting that I have heard from like people who do study humanities. It's just that like, like, like you said, STEM majors, I guess just... They kind of just study things that already exist. But like we're not, I guess, building like... You, they can say that they have created this moral system and so mm. that makes them better, right? Because they oh. created this whole system that society yeah. is based on. But we are just kind of like looking at what already exists and we're yeah. trying to understand it. Yeah. Like all, all, all we're doing is just like taking a notebook, looking at mm-hmm. the sky and writing things down. Whereas mm-hmm. like the humanities majors are taking a notebook and creating an entire like uh-huh. sky, basically. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting perspective, but that assumes that STEM is limited to only recording. But I think where, where STEM actually shines through is, is where you apply the things that you've recorded in your notebook to create new things. Mm. I've always like, 
like, because I know that you do computer science, but, like, mm-hmm. is computer science, like, but it's, so, like, code is created by humans, though, right? Yeah, but, like, at the fundamental level, like, at the fundamental level, the only reason computer science exists is because we have a good understanding of electronics and, like, the laws of physics. Because, mm. like, at the end of the day, yeah, the computer science language that you're using is made by a human. But mm. what's happening within your computer, those are, like, the laws of physics mm. being, like, being computed in front of your own eyes. Like, it's everything goes down to ones and zeros, which are just electrical signals mm-hmm. and, you know, with transistors and, like, um, just signals coming in and out of your computer that we would not be able to put together without a good understanding of physics and um, science. Mm. Also, like, I think there is also, like, a, a superiority complex, like, within, like, the different practices, right? Because I always feel like, like, math majors have a very, like, superiority over, like, let's say computer science majors. Mm. Because math is considered, like, a very hard, like, oh, yeah. science. It's just, like, it's, like, literally, like, pure calculation. Yeah. Yeah, and computer science has this um, superiority over data science. Uh-huh. Yeah, there's always these hierarchies that people make. And, you know, I think it's also reflected in like the income that each field Mm. raises like whichever field's harder will raise a higher income I think because then there's less there's a less supply of labor that goes into that field because it's harder do you think that like the the increase or like the higher income that is available in stem fields reflects like its inherent difficulty because less people are able to reach that like degree of expertise versus humanities majors like the, like the supply is greater right because more people are able to reach that expertise with like lower levels of education yeah you know i think in in general yeah because the majority of stem fields are like desk jobs like you're sitting on a desk and doing something so uh-huh. the actual difficulty of the job tends to be the same it's just the difficulty of getting the training required for the job is different and the reason i mention that is because something like plumbing earns a lot of money like Mm, for for you to be a plumber true, takes true. a lot of um it, it takes almost no educational background but it earns you a lot of money but the reason there's a low supply of plumbers is because the job itself is difficult within stem the jobs themselves are all the same it's just the amount of knowledge you need to get each job differs that's true i think a lot of it does have to do with like the glamour or like the kind of clout associated with the job mm-hmm. like like, for example, like, journalists have, like, way or, like, their their required education is much less than, let's say, like, a computer science or an engineer. Mm-hmm. But, like, they, like, get all these, you know, they're very, like, glorified. And, like, you know, like, oh, wow, you're a journalist. You're, like, fighting the good fight and you win, mm-hmm. like, Pulitzer Prizes and whatever, things like that. Mm-hmm. And I think that, yeah, I think that a lot of it maybe has to do with, like, people are deterred from pursuing STEM because it's just not as, like, it's not as, like, you know, like, a glorious job it's not as cool as like being a lawyer or like being yeah a pol- like a philosopher or something like that yeah and i've also and let's let's just finish up after this thought because uh-huh. we've reached the time limit. <laughs> yeah. it was so interesting um i've also just noticed that it's harder to conduct research in certain fields mm. like like what draws people in is like the the idea of like discovering something new right yeah um but with like some STEM fields with like computer science, it's like you're not discovering anything. It's more like you're applying your knowledge unless it's something like AI where you're like you're discovering a new data set by creating it and then discovering new results. But even that, it's it's not as like as big of a deal as like discovering a new black hole or something like that. So uh-huh. even within STEM, I think what draws people in most is like how how much potential there is to like do something out of the ordinary that's true yeah okay um so we'll just end the episode here thank you all for listening and we'll see you all next time